kids, they love superheroes. Adults, they love superheroes as well. The world loves superheroes. To quote a New York Times uh, article that came out recently, it says, a global obsession. Superhero movies have been seen by hundreds of millions, arguably the most consumed stories in human history. Literally tens of billions of dollars have been spent on seeing uh, movies around superheroes. Four of the top 10 grossing movies in all time are based on the Avengers series. How many people have seen the Avengers series? I was going to count on how much money has been spent, but we'll do that later. But uh, you know, you can follow that up though in the top 20 with Spider-Man, The Incredibles, and Captain America. So who are some of your favorite superheroes? Shout them out for me. I heard Mighty Mouse, Captain America, Wonder Woman. Did someone say Wonder Woman? <laughs> yeah, as a child, I, uh, I watched uh, Batman and Robin and uh, re remember that series well. Um, but I, uh, we, we accused our neighbor ha of having a doll because it was the Batman and, and Robin size, and we thought that was not very masculine at the time. But I, I've grown up, and my, my tastes have refined, and really my new favorite is The Incredibles. Um, I really enjoy uh, what Pixar's done with The Incredibles. I, I, I find the family dynamic of a super family rather intriguing. All the challenges of a typical family with the added boost of incredible power and evil villains. I don't want to say that's like our house. That might be too personal. But, um, but let's think about what makes a hero. It's certainly more than a cape. Um, you can buy one of these on Amazon for about $10, and if you have Amazon Prime, it'll be here in two days. <laughs> but it usually involves some extraordinary powers, you know, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, but it's more than just power. It is power that is used for society's greater good. A hero will often prevent a crime, stop a tragedy, save a life, uh, stop a disaster. But heroes are more than just fictional uh, characters found in movies and comic books or TV shows. There, are, there have been many real, live, living heroes throughout time. In 2005, there was a uh, TV series that was hosted by Matt Lauer on NBC. It was titled The Greatest American. And the top five were listed here. They are Ronald Reagan, the actor and 40th president, Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., minister and our civil rights leader, George Washington, a founding father, general, and our first president, Benjamin Franklin, author, printer, scientist, and politician, don't you think he looks a lot like that guy that's on the $100 bill? I think it's an uncanny resemblance between those two. I don't see those very often, but once I did see one. So, but they're heroes for their leadership, they're heroes for their accomplishments, and for their values. So who is your hero? Is it a teacher? Is it a parent? Is it a mentor? Is it a coach? Think about some of those folks in your mind, you know, uh, you know, maybe it's that uh, coach that helped you uh, really develop and find a passion for that sport. Maybe it's the music teacher that taught you that instrument. Maybe it's your father or your mother that uh, showed you how to, um, you know, change the uh, change your first tire. But this morning we're going to be looking at Gideon in Judges chapter six and seven. And so we're going to uh, look at the question of, was Gideon a hero or was he a zero? Well, we've talked a little bit about what a hero is, so let's talk a little bit about what it means to be a zero. It is that wide receiver that drops the game-winning catch with no time on the clock, where that moment of, of being the hero slips through their hands. It's the time you locked your keys in the car in the middle of nowhere and your cell phone doesn't work. Or it's when you come home and you remember you re, uh, that it's your spouse's birthday and uh, you have nothing uh, and you didn't buy a card. Those are the times where you feel like you're a zero more than a hero. 
But before we dig into today's text, would you join with me as, in prayer uh, as we invite uh, the Holy Spirit uh, to be amongst us? Holy Father, you are mighty. You are powerful. You're all-knowing. You're the creator of the world. You're the creator of the universe. You're the supreme power over everything. Lord, we ask you that you would give us a thirst for your word, a hunger only you can fill. Lord, we ask you that you would pour out your love, pour out your grace, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself this morning to each of us. Our gratitude for your grace is so in is, is not sufficient for the incredible gift that you gave with your son on the cross. Your love, your compassion is beyond any measure. Lord, we just ask that you would set aside any of those things this morning that are distracting us. The traffic coming down 19th Street, the homework we didn't get done, the, uh, the work that still needs to be completed before tomorrow morning. Lord, we just ask that you would fill us this morning with your words. Amen. As a reminder, um, my name's Garrett Doyle, and um, I'm one of the elders here at the church, and we are filling in for Pastor Len about once a month so that he can focus on his thesis. I offered to help write his thesis, thesis, and he has graciously declined. I think it had something to do with the cape, but I'm not sure. But uh, please continue to pray for Len as he works on his doctoral thesis and, and he uh, uh, puts that together and uh, does those uh, studies as he pursues uh, his doctorate in ministry at uh, Denver Seminary. But today we're going to be looking at Gideon. Many of you are familiar with the account of Gideon as one of the judges appointed by God. He demonstrates both great obedience as well as deep doubts. You may remember that he destroys all the uh, idols built to the other gods as he was commanded to by Yahweh. But yet Gideon demands miraculous signs with the fleece from God as he experiences tremendous deep doubt. So the question we raise is, is he a hero or is he a zero? So turn with me this morning to uh, Judges chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew in front of you. It'll be on page 169. Uh, you can turn to 169 in a different Bible, but there's not a very good chance you're going to land in Judges. <laughs> um, if you have your uh, phone, feel free to open it up and um, open up your Bible app. And I will predominantly be using the NIV version this morning, so that's what's in the pew in front of you, or if you want to change that on your, on your Bible app uh, 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 in your phone. In addition, we'll project up most of the passages this morning, so if it's just easier to follow along that way, uh, not a problem. But let's start with uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, verse 1 in chapter 6. And it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. For seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, how quickly the nation of Israel wanders. You may be familiar with the saying, and you may have seen it on a sticker, a bumper sticker or on a t-shirt that says, not all who wander are lost. I'm going to challenge this. Wandering is a pretty good sign that you're lost. I know I have wandered. I've seen several of you wandering in King Supers, <laughs> like me. Have you ever noticed at King Supers how they never really group things appropriately? You know, if you're trying to find tomato sauce or spaghetti sauce, and you go, oh, I also need to get a uh, jar of salsa. They're both made from tomatoes, right? Are they in the same aisle? No. And then you go down further, and you're like, oh, and I need a can of tomato sauce. Is that in the same aisle? No. I can keep going. Oh, and a tomato soup. Do we have it in the same aisle? No. I don't understand this. That's why I wander in the grocery store. I, I guarantee you, this is all just pureed tomatoes with a couple of different spices, but somehow they need to spread it out through the entire grocery store. So what happens when I wander? I end up with all kinds of other stuff in my grocery cart. <laughs> 
Did you know the ice cream sandwiches are right next to the spaghetti sauce? <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it and please don't challenge me. As we look at the wandering Israelites, they found all kinds of evil. On the back of your bulletin, you're, there's a place for you to take notes. And so I would encourage you, and if you don't use the bulletin and you have your own notebook or you write them in your phone, I'm only going to ask you to write down four words this morning. So you don't need a whole lot of space. So the first word I want you to write down is tomato soup. No, I'm just kidding. It's wander. <laughs> so uh, wander, W-A-N-D-E-R, not wonder, wander. How swift the Lord's judgment is as he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So let's, uh, before we look at Gideon and his role as a leader, I would be remiss not to pause on this first. Let's look at it one more time. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I'm concerned that our view of evil in our society has been sensationalized. We go and watch a superhero movie and we see people blowing up and, you know, we even think it's fun to dress up as villains on, on, on Halloween. But we would be sadly mistaken to not recognize that evil is real and that God's justice is as well. God is also absolutely gracious. He's not just gracious in the New Testament. He's also gracious in the Old Testament. But don't dismiss the fact that God is just. In Hebrews 6.10, it clearly states, God is not unjust. In Psalms 89.14, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. God is, justice, is just, and, just, and there will be justice for the evil in the world. There will be justice for the evil in each of us. The only hope we have the only chance we have is the grace that is offered to each of us through Jesus Christ when he bore our sins on the cross. So I want to just caution you. If you're flirting with evil, be prepared for the mighty hand of, the just, of justice. Israel, as God's chosen people, received justice. So will each of us. In verses 2 through 5, you can read uh, how the, the oppression of the Midianites, it was so great that all Israel could do was hide in caves as they literally starved to death. We underestimate the power of evil. Individually, we think we can beat it. The drunk driver never thinks he's going to kill or be killed. The liar never thinks he'll be uh, found out. The cheater never thinks they'll be caught. Why? I think it is often because of simple pride. We think we can deal with it. So if you're flirting with evil this morning, I challenge you to uh, consider um, Jesus Christ because he is the only hope that we have. So let's look at verse 6. And verse 6 says, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Good news we can also cry out to the Lord for help. You can cry out to the Lord for help. Evil is powerful. Evil is destructive. But God is stronger and he can restore us. What can we do? We can cry out for help. Why don't we do it? Let's be honest. There is short-term pleasure in sin. There is a short-term pleasure of that. Every Halloween, there's short-term pleasure with ingesting four pounds of candy. You will pay for it, and you will experience the pain later. Other times, we think we can do it on our own. We wander because we refuse to ask for directions. We can't find the tomato soup because we won't ask somebody for help. We continue to go up and down the aisle, and before you know it, you have ice cream sandwiches. But it's simple, pride. We think we could do it ourselves. Judges uh, uh, verses 7 and 8 say, When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet. God hears their cry for answers. I've got one more thing in here. Let me see if we can get this one out. Gideon the deliverer has arrived. 
If I woke anybody up, I deeply apologize. (laughs) We'll see this trumpet appear a few more times uh, throughout this passage. But the extent of my uh, melodic uh, will not be much different, to warn you. (laughs) But uh, verse 12 goes on to say, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, uh, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. An angel appearing was certainly a surprise. Was it also a surprise to Gideon that the angel addressed him as mighty warrior? I came in this morning and a lot of people shook my hand and no one called me mighty warrior. (laughs) If you want to afterwards, uh, that's okay. Uh, I I can handle it. But uh, I think Gideon was somewhat surprised by that. In fact, let's look at verse 13 and see his response. And it says, um, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this stuff happened to us? First, I love the polite way Gideon addresses the angel. Excuse me, pardon me, as if he's accidentally bumped into him at the grocery store. I was just trying to find the tomato soup. But he seems to completely ignore the fact that he was addressed as a mighty warrior. Uh, Then Gideon starts down this path of why? Why has this happened to us? Why is all this bad things happening? Do you think Gideon was simply ignorant about what was going on, or was he in oblivious to the evil acts of Israel? Do you think he was participating in some of these acts? You know, but it seems strange that he's calling out asking why to this question. And so my question that I raised before comes up again. Is Gideon a hero, or is Gideon a zero? Let's lurk on to verse 17. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, Give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Have you ever done this? God, give me a sign. Show, show me what you would have, uh, what my will, your will would be for me in this time. So sometimes we kind of explore the uh, the traffic light theology. Have you ever done this traffic light theology? Driving down the road, not sure what to do, trying to pray, and okay, God, if the light's green. That means, go, okay, so there's only a couple of you have done this, okay, so just got, <laughs> kind of join with me, okay, the, uh, the traffic light is red, it means, okay, if the traffic light is yellow, it means, <laughs> slow down, Len. <laughs> I did this once, prayed the prayer, get up to the traffic light, and it was out. I'm I'm sorry. (laughs) What do you do then, right? But, you know, we we, uh, stumble across this uh, um, traffic light theology, and and we end up finding ourselves in a a situation of doubt. So that's the next word I want you to write down on the back of your uh, worship program or take notes, is to write the word doubt, D-O-U-B-T. I spell it because I don't spell well. So uh, if you would write that down, uh, we'll be talking more about that this morning. So what is doubt? It's really just the feeling of uncertainty. So the question is, is doubt wrong? Is doubt sinful? Candidly, there's a, quite a bit of doubt about what this really, whether it is or not. There's a lot of discussion about whether doubt is sinful or not. In fact, entire books have been written about it. But uh, in my brief study, um, what you do with your doubt is really what matters. Where does it lead you? So this morning, we're going to look and see where it led uh, Gideon, because you'll see throughout the next uh, 62 verses, or uh, there was quite a bit of doubt. So let's look at uh, the next verse, 20 where it says, the angel of the God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and the tomato soup and place them on this rock and pour out the breath, uh, the broth. And Gideon did so. What did Gideon do? He did so. <laughs> Sometimes we have a problem in our life with did so's. <laughs> have you ever had problems with a did so? Really, the, the challenge is obedience the ability or the uh, willingness to actually follow. So in simple terms, Gideon obeyed. 
as I mentioned, it's simple words, but sometimes it's difficult to do. What should we do when we experience doubt? Anybody have any ideas? Call out to God. Remember from a few verses back, that's what we, do, uh, what we can do. This is the next word you should write down on your notes, and that's the word obedience. Now, this one is really a lot more challenging to spell, so I would just write down the word obey, because <laughs> it's a lot easier. O-B-E-Y. I, during my entire preparation of the sermon, spelt it with an A in obedience and not an E. So I'm just hoping we could, as a collective group, can we agree that we should do it with an A from this point forward? <laughs> but obedience... It's interesting that it's uh, a word that uh, I didn't spell well. Uh, I hope that's not a complete reflection on me and the challenge that I don't write it down very often. But it's easy for us to judge the doubt of others. We may consider their doubt weakness, but we are clearly called to, and instructed to be merciful. If you look at the book of Jude in verse 22, it says, Be merciful to those who doubt. Jude 22, not a book that we spend a ton of time in. It's unfortunate that the church, frankly, has a reputation of shooting their wounded rather than showing mercy. When you see someone struggling with doubt, instead of shaking your head, this is an opportunity for you to come alongside them, to join them, and to uh, encourage them. It's not an excuse for, the, for that doubt to lead to evil, but it is an opportunity for that doubt to lead to a calling out to God, an opportunity for that doubt to lead to obedience. So uh, in verse 25, it reads, that same night the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pool beside it. The Lord then asked Gideon to destroy the altar to Baal. Desecrating religious symbols is uh, it's serious business. If somebody came into our church and uh, tore these down and we came in uh, this morning and they were laying in a heap, we would call the Golden Police Department and, uh, and uh, call this a hate crime. And we'd be angry. We'd be upset. This was a big deal. Um, if, you got, if we caught the perpetrator, they'd likely be put in jail, not just for destruction, but for actual uh, hate crimes. Verse 27 goes on to say, So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Obedience. Gideon did as the Lord told him. This is another highlight to look at the obedience of um, Gideon. So he does this in the cover of darkness. It's probably obvious, but why? So he doesn't get caught. He doesn't want to want to um, catch grief from uh, from the town folks. Also, he didn't want to catch grief from his dad. He has reasons to be concerned. As I mentioned, this is kind of a hate crime. This is a serious infraction. In verse 30, it, um, it, I paraphrase, the people of the town demanded of Joash, which is his dad, bring out your son, he must die, because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pool beside it. So Gideon knew the consequence and the potential uh, problems that this would cause. The definition of doubt is a feeling of uncertainty. But I find it to be interesting as well as that then another alternate definition is lack of conviction. Was Gideon simply being prudent by doing this at night or did he really lack conviction about what he was doing? The fear and the doubt were real, but Gideon obeyed. It was not the depth of the doubt or the, what ma is what matters, but it was the willingness to obey. I'm seeing a pattern. Doubt, then obedience. Doubt, then obedience. 
Okay, we're going to try this one more time. I think I've got three in me. <laughs> okay, it's getting, it's getting better. Not really. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew the trumpet, summoning the Abyssalites to follow him. Things are looking up. Gideon has gained some confidence. And then he goes on to verse 35, and, he read, and I read, He sent the messenger to Manasseh, calling them to arms, also into Asherah, Zubalan, and Nephtali, so that they, went, they too went, so that they too went up to meet them. So um, I'd have to say that things aren't quite as rosy as they once were. Um, I think we're starting to see that the doubt has creeped up. You know, first he started off with uh, calling his people, but then because he was a little nervous, he decided he needed to grab some other uh, some other clan uh, members of the other clans to come and join him. So the doubt has uh, has returned. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate that back at the sound booth. <laughs> I, they're pretty quick on their feet, though, aren't they? Um, so we're going to uh, talk about the fleece, which is um, uh, something that we are probably pretty familiar with um, in, uh, in this passage. And it says, um, let's, uh, let's keep going a couple more slides. I think there's going to be one where it shows the fleece. There we go. Oh, we're almost to the fleece. <laughs> So I'm going to read out of the message and try to cover a, a pretty big uh, chunk of uh, scripture here. So it says, Gideon said to God, if this is right, if you're using me to save Israelite as you, Israel as you have said, then look, I'm placing a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If dew is on the fleece only, but the floor is dry, then I know that you will use me to save Israel as you said. That's what happened. He got up early the next morning. He wrung out the fleece, even due to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Don't be impatient with me, but let me say one more thing. I want to try another time with the fleece, but this time let the fleece stay dry while the dew drenches the ground. God made it happen that very night. Only the fleece was dry while the ground was wet with dew. The doubt returns. Maybe it never left. Gideon boldly tests God. In fact, he calls it a test in verse 39. Allow me one more test with the fleece. Maybe we should be calling him the, the doubting Gideon. You know, we, in the New Testament, we have the doubting Thomas, but it really feels like this doubt is something that has crept up and, st and, and keeps reoccurring in Gideon's life. But as previously noted in Jude, God's response is merciful. He shows mercy despite the doubt that he saw. So for the sake of time, I'm going to quickly move through uh, the first part of the book of Judges. So you may need to read all of the book of uh, the chapter 7 on your own to catch all the details, but um, you'll see some pictures up here on the, on, on the screen, and they'll make sense as, I, as we uh, look at uh, this chapter. So back in Judges 6, 33 and 34, Gideon had grand ideas of using a large army to run out the Midianites. Uh, but God starts a serious pruning session. The army starts off with 32,000. And if you look at the uh, screen on the bottom left corner, that's the, uh, that's, uh, the Folsom Field up in Boulder. And uh, that's a pretty typical att attendance number at a CU football game is around 30, 35,000 uh, people um, at, the, at the game. Then God calls Gideon to reduce it down to 10,000. So in the upper left-hand corner, that's a Coors Event Center up in uh, Boulder as well. And that holds about the same, about 10,000 uh, uh, folks. Then the final number is 300. And if you look around uh, on a Christmas Eve, if we pack them in real tight 
if Lee sets up just a few extra chairs in the back and we all squeeze and get to know our neighbors, we can get about 300 people in here. So that's a pretty big contrast. CU football game, First Baptist Church, Christmas Eve. So get, uh, keep that mu- uh, number in your head. At this point, Gideon had one warrior for every 450 enemies. I don't like those odds. <laughs> it's clear to Gideon and everyone else that a victory can only be achieved by the hand of God. It's, it was clear that it was going to take a, a miraculous thing to happen in order for them to have victory. And before we, uh, I'd like to kind of do a little pause of our message for a second so that we can hear a testimony from Terry about God providing in his ministry. Terry, would you come? If you want some soup, that's fine. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Good morning. Um, My name is Terry Thompson, and um, this church has been such a blessing to provide a giveaway for the international students for 33 years. Thank you, guys. And um, this year, for the first time in 33 years, we didn't have enough furniture, which is, yeah. And three weeks before the giveaway, we just sent out a prayer request. Would you please pray that God will raise up some furniture? And um, that week uh, in the mail, we got a check for several thousand dollars. Uh, Wow, thank you, Jesus. And so we rented a 26-foot U-Haul truck and went down to a, I thought, man, I'm going to hit every thrift store in Denver and try to, you know, make up for the need. This was on a Tuesday. Somebody asked me if it was on a Saturday. It wasn't. And I was hoping to get a discount because of senior day, but um, furniture isn't usually on discount. And all the furniture we found was not on discount. So I go to the first store, and I never, well, we we dropped off furniture. We've never picked up furniture at a thrift store. I get to drive right up to the door where you drop off, pick up furniture with a 26-foot truck, which never happens. So that was my first thank you, Lord. And I walked in, and the guy said, what can I do for you, bud? And I said, well, I'm here to buy some furniture. And he says, is that your truck? Yeah. And I said, I'll, t- I'll just kind of look around and tell you what I want. He goes, okay. So I'm making a lo- note, and I'm uh, writing down how much everything is at thrift store prices. And I think I've spent several thousand dollars. And we don't ask for a discount. We don't, um, you know, try to do pious begging. And so when he t- I ready to check out he's walking around making receipt after receipt after receipt writing out all this furniture that I've chosen he goes what are you going to do with all this and I said well we have international students who come to the Colorado School of Mines uh, from halfway around the world with two suitcases and you can't bring much furniture and uh, and he goes oh that's really cool I said so what do you do with it and I said well we just give it to him for free and I said and then we take it to their houses for free and he goes well that's really neat so that's what Jesus tells us to do. And uh, so I get to the um, checkout, and the lady rings up, I think it was five receipts, um, and I still have half of the money left. Yeah, half of the money left. And I thought, well, Lord, you really wanted these students to have some. And it's really a busy time, so that next Tuesday, I thought, okay, Lord, where do I go next? And I was just going to make go the opposite way because I'd cleaned out that thrift store. And God really moved me just to go the same route. So I go to the same store, and I'm picking out this furniture. And the guy goes, you back again? Yeah. You from the church? Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, you need some more furniture? Yep. And the, you get to pull the 26-foot truck up. And the first load was, the 26-foot truck was half full. So I'm not expecting to get a lot here, because I cleaned them out a week ago. And I started looking for furniture, and um, he said, this is really neat that you do that. I said, well, what's really exciting is some of the students don't know that God has given them a home that's fully furnished, and they don't have to pay for it. They just have to accept his offer to go to enter it when they leave this world. And uh, I give them a, a little, uh, it's a bookmark track, and uh, tell him the plan of salvation. And then the, I, some other uh, employees said, wow, this is really cool. I got to tell them the same thing. That was the best part of it. So I check out with my, I don't know, five or six receipts, and I still have half the money left. Actually, $1,000 left. And um, so I thought, wow, Lord, this is really amazing. 
So the this is the now we bring all the furniture into the the to the church the week before the giveaway and really appreciate all the helpful hands who helped unload that furniture and organize it that week and then deliver it that that weekend. If you're here and you've been involved, would you raise your hand? You are hands of the Lord. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. And so we get all the furniture unloaded and I told Trudy I'm looking around and Trudy has the furniture kind of separated. We don't have enough furniture. This is going to be embarrassing. This is going to be like inviting the students to a fireworks display and having five sparklers. It wasn't going to be very, um, and it was going to be anticlimactic. So the week of the giveaway, I go shopping again and go to the same store. And, and the guy goes, hey, I'm not working here today. I'm working the other part. Um, so he takes me in and tells the person who's in charge of that department, hey, this is my best customer. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, what a neat honor to be the best customer in a thrift store. So I, 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 you know, so again, just try to spend everything we can. And I check out, $283 left. Yeah, this is the third time. And by this time, a 10 by 20 foot shed is completely full from top to bottom, eight feet high with furniture. We had to use a ladder to stack it. And, um, no, I'm sorry, that was before, that was the second, after the second one. Now this, this is the week of the giveaway, so we had to take it directly into the church. And then Tree says, you know, we need some mattress uh, protectors. And, uh, and I said, well, man, here's $283. And so she went to Walmart and bought some mattress protectors for um, the beds that had been collected. And uh, she came home and I said, well, finally we got it spent. She goes, no, we don't. We still have $90. Yeah. And so we still have $90 from, all, from, those, from that one sale. Or one, and it was like God just kept providing. It was weird how God just kept producing. And I told Trudy, when we get down to the last $10, I just want to frame that as an altar of what God had done. Um, but anyway, we just were totally amazed how God had provided such good things. And uh, the students were, were um, really got some really neat things. And that was the first time we've ever had to buy furniture uh, in order to um, have a, a giveaway. So praise you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for sharing how God miraculously works today just like he did with, uh, with Gideon and the obedience um, uh, that, uh, that Terry and Trudy and Tia and that ministry share uh, show to, to uh, reaching our international students. So let's get back to the uh, account of how God provided for Israel. In uh, Judges uh, 7.22, it reads, When the 300 trumpets sounded... The Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Okay, I'm going to try to do it one more time. Okay. Picture that being 300 times. Should I do it 299 more? <laughs> I wish we had, uh, had time to dive into all the details of this great victory, but I'll leave it to you this week to do that on your own. Read the first uh, 22, ver uh, 22 verses of this chapter. But the key takeaway is the Lord caused and the Lord provided. Not Gideon, not the army. It was clearly God's victory. They walked into battle and this was their weapon. This was their sword. This is all they had. And the only thing that they could offer was their obedience. That's all they had to uh, conquer to conquer the, uh, to, uh, the Midianites. So in uh, verse uh, 32 and 33, I'm going to condense that a little bit, and it says, Gideon, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administrated justice, and, and gained what was promised. Sorry, that's Hebrews 11, uh, 32 and 33. Gideon, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administrated justice, and gained what was promised. Faith and obedience are tightly intertwined. Gideon was obedient, 
And then we just uh, read in, in Hebrews, Gideon was also faithful. The author of Hebrews is commending Gideon along with others for their faithfulness. Gideon obeyed God's instructions. Gideon demonstrated the deep connection between faithfulness and, and obedience. Uh, R.C. Sprawl describes obedience as faith and action. It's acting upon um, what you know to be true. So when we go back to this title slide, I think we may have started with the wrong question, but we were pretty far down the path with getting this cool logo put together, so we're going to keep it. But the question is, who is the hero? Isn't whether Gideon was the hero. And in this case, God was the hero, not Gideon. God is the one who delivered. God is the one who provided. Gideon was the obedient vessel that he was able to participate in this. So we're going to conclude with the, last, uh, with the last slide of going through the four points. And you probably have these written down, at least three of them. First, we are prone to wander. And wandering can lead to evil. Israel repeatedly wandered into trouble. Um, I don't know if you've ever listened to Dave Ramsey. He's kind of a finance guy. Uh, uh, with a Christian a belief. And he says, it's so easy to wander into debt, but it's so hard to wander out. <laughs> and I would say that's similar in our lives. It's so easy to wander, then before you know it, we find ourselves out in the middle uh, of nowhere and crying out for help. We have doubts. Gideon repeatedly had doubts. What doubts or where are you doubting today what is your experience with doubt and then I would say instead of beating yourself up that you have doubt use this as an opportunity to call out to God this is your opportunity to call on the almighty savior of the world we are called to obedience this is not an optional exercise we are called to actively live out our faith in obedience. Even with great doubt, Gideon was able to step up and obeyed. Obedience is faith in action. And then last, God is the hero. God is our hero. God can also be your hero. Call out to your hero. Maybe it's the first time ever. If you don't have a relationship with God personally, that's available to you. It's not something that was unique for Gideon. That is available to us today. But maybe it's the hundredth or the thousandth time for you. But the great news is God's waiting. God is ready to hear your cry. And he's ready and excited for you to be a part of his great plan. It is exciting to see God working today as he did in the, in the days of Israel. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are just so excited to see the way that you're at work, not just in Gideon's time, but in our own church, in our own midst. Thank you, Lord, for the way that um, the Terry and Trudy and Tia were able to organize and lead and provide for international students in this way. Thank you for the opportunity that we had to unload the truck and deliver furniture and support. Thank you, Lord, that you want us to be a part of this grand plan, that we get to be one of your great vessels. Thank you, Lord, that even in our doubts, you show mercy. Even in our weakness, we can cry out to you. Lord, we cry out to you this morning. We acknowledge that we're weak and that only through you can we have victory. Lord, we are so prone to wander. It is so easy for us to find evil. It is so easy to find us in the wilderness. Lord, bring us back. Lord, we call out to you in your son's name. Amen.